barnegat. The word has weight. What she lacks in depth, she makes up for in distance. 42 miles of beautiful brackish water stretching from Bayhead in the north to Little Egg Harbor in the south. Millions cross over in hopes of reaching seaside, beach haven, the ocean. But those in the know choose to stop at her mucky shores. It makes me think of a place that involves a lot of people in a lot of different ways. Water butters and fishing and crabbing and, and sailing. But it also means, you know, people back in the pines enjoying uh, the, the, the source of the water in Barnegat Bay, uh, valuing the streams that, that feed the bay. The bay is a sort of a report card on what's going on on the land around it. And if the bay is in good, clean shape, then that tends to mean that the people around the bay are in harmony with nature. In the 1970s, the tagline, you'll never go in the water again, made us hesitate. While it's been decades since the film Jaws was released, a new menace has emerged in the water, the jellyfish. You know, I was working in the Bay, 90s through the 2000s. I would see them, but it wasn't like that they were on my radar. And then all of a sudden we start to see them in incredible numbers. For most invasive species, this is what happens. They fly under the radar for a long time until all of a sudden you open your eyes and you're like, they're everywhere. How, how did we miss this? We've seen big changes in the bay. In particular, loss of habitat, changes in water flow. Certainly Hurricane Sandy in 2012 really radically changed what the bay looks like. We started to see a lot of sort of exotic species showing up. Several types of jellyfish have called Barnegat Bay home for millennium. Others are recent intruders. There are comb jelly, sea nettles, bay nettles, and clinging jellyfish. The clinging jellyfish, which is a relatively new arrival from the Pacific Ocean, it's called the clinging jellyfish because it holds on to things like algae and seagrass. This little individual is maybe the size of a quarter. That's about the maximum size. However, they have these incredible paralysis uh, venoms that they inject into people. Typically, most jellyfish stings, you get sort of a very high, intense pain, and then it begins to sort of uh, go down. And the clinging jellies, you can tell that you've been stung, but it's not that painful. But over time, it just keeps rising and rising and rising until three, four, five hours later, people are just in incredible pain as these paralysis toxins sort of work their way through the body and cause muscles to tighten and clench, and then they won't release. The sea nettle has been a familiar face in the bay for generations. Recently, however, the bay nettle, hailing from the Chesapeake, has appeared and has used the past few decades to grow in numbers, now calling the Barnegat Bay its home as well. So we actually have what we call true sea nettles, which occur sort of offshore, and then we have what is referred to as the true bay nettle, and they're different species. Originally, we had worked with the assumption that it's the same one, but in fact, our bay nettle is identical to the Chesapeake bay nettle. In the, the work that was done around 1900 to 1960, there's no evidence of that bay nettle in Barnegat Bay. Somewhere between 1960 and probably 1980, they got into the bay. Now, did they come in because the workers were at the nuclear power plant and they were bringing things in there? Were people down in the Chesapeake and they sailed their boats up and they brought the polyps that got released? Nobody knows the specific origins of them. And now in, in lagoons, you know, you drop in and there's hundreds of them just all over the place. You know, you can't possibly swim without being stung. No matter the type of jelly, these animals are evolutionary miracles. Very, very simple design, incredible 
in terms of their capacities to, to grow and reproduce sexually, asexually, clone themselves. They have all different pathways of survival. They have two different parts of their life history. So one of which is called the polyp. It's really small, it lives on docks or bulkheads or on rocks, and in some places, we don't even know where they are. And that's when they're really sort of cloning themselves. And then they release really tiny, what we call a phyrus, sort of the first budding stage. And then when they're ready, they produce what we consider a jellyfish, which is the medusa stage. And that's the sexual reproduction. So then that's what we see when we think about a jellyfish sort of swimming around. You could kill every jelly that's in the water and there'll be just as many next year because it's that polyp stage that regenerates every year to make the new batch. Typically present in the Northern Bay, overdevelopment, the introduction of lagoon communities, bulkheads, and low oxygen in the water have pushed the nettles to the south. We create permanent structures and it interferes with what Mother Nature really wants to do, revitalizing. So if you create it static, and, and that's what a lagoon community is, lots of bulkheads, it's less marsh and more lagoons means more jellyfish because those lagoons lower oxygen, jellyfish really aren't affected by it. Things that need more oxygen that are good competitors, barnacles, things like that, they lose, they die, and the jellyfish win by default. They're like, okay, you can't live here, I will, and I'll clone myself, and I'll make lots of myself all over the place. And in fact, in 2012, we actually started them showing up in some of the lagoon systems near Beach Haven, so just south of uh, the Route 72 bridge. And those are the same types of habitat that the jellyfish thrive in the northern part of the bay. Once their populations get up to high numbers, then that tidal force is going to put those into the lower part, into Little Lake Harbor. And then it's a jump from there down into the Tuckerton region. Nestled along the western shore of central Barnegat Bay, quietly stands the Oyster Creek nuclear power plant Opened in 1969, the plant was a source of pride and employment for neighboring communities. At the same time, it devastated water quality and nearby species. For decades, the plant's antiquated cooling system sucked over a billion gallons of water and all living things nearby into the plant. The water was then heated at high temperatures and propelled back into the bay. The closing of the plant in 2018 has resulted in a shock to the system as nature attempts to rebalance. With the closure of Oyster Creek, one of the oldest operating nuclear facilities in the United States, we expect some very positive things to come out of there. Because it was a water-cooled plant, it sucked up an incredible amount of water. And in that water were fish larvae, fish eggs, crab larvae, and essentially those were killed in that process. There's an expectation that we ought to start to see a recovery in many of those species. At the same point, it also sucked up a lot of jellyfish. Those jellyfish populations, now that they're not going to be destroyed by the plant, are subsequently going to increase in that region of the bay. A lot of our sampling, um, specifically for Oyster Creek, to look at how that might cause changes in the jellyfish population is sampling you know, near and far from the plant. So we do plankton tow. So we literally take nets, tow them behind the boat, and then we're really looking for early stages. So the, the ephiral stage of, of sea nettles in particular is of great interest because we know then our polyps around, what are those kinds of densities? Because that's what turns into those adults. And for the depth, we have 4.10 meters. We go out there um, about every other week during the summer, um, take these samples, and then sort of how does that compare to other places within the bay? That allows us to get a better understanding. What did the jellyfish populations look like before the closure of the plant? And now after it's been closed for several years, how is that recovery? Those areas that are far away from the plant really shouldn't see a big difference because they weren't really impacted by the plant to begin with. You know, we did see some differences between 2018 and 2019, but it was minor. Now we've got several years post-closure 
What do the systems look like? How have they shifted and changed? What are we seeing in terms of the types of organisms that are out in the bay? But it really won't be until we can analyze the data that we collect this year that we're really gonna be able to have a better understanding as to what were the impacts of the closure of the plant and the response of the organisms in the bay. We do have this love-hate. You know, we don't want to get stung, but we love seeing them. They're fascinating, they're, they're beautiful. In some cases, they can be deadly, but they're around. And we have to respect it, and we have to understand it. But we can also mitigate when they become problems. If we want to think about how do we get rid of jellyfish, any step to improving water quality. So anytime that you can reduce fertilizers, reduce what goes into the bay, those are all positive steps. If you have a floating dock at the end of the season, if you can pull it to let it dry to kind of kill those polyps underneath it, permanently removing those docks also minimizes the habitat that they can use for those polyp stages. You know, when we think about the, the bay and we think about water quality, we recognize that in changing environments, in degraded water quality, species like jellyfish actually thrive. They do better. So they kind of win by default. We're kind of at a crossroads. The state of New Jersey implemented actually some really amazing nutrient and fertilizer bans and, and very strong restrictions. The question is, you know, have we reached a tipping point? where the system is really going to be massively degraded. And I don't think that that's the situation yet. I think that we see some very positive signs with the closure of Oyster Creek Nuclear Generating Station. All of a sudden, we don't have these huge thermal inputs that are also adding stress to the bay. So hopefully, we're going to start to see some recovery from um, the shutdown of that plant. Those are really important components to the overall improvement of water quality and the health of the bay. So I don't know that we're ever gonna see what it looked like 50 years ago. Can it get better? Can it improve? And the answer is absolutely, but it takes effort. I'm a little bit of a cynic with ever increasing global populations and more harvesting of natural resources. If that's how we measure progress, then it's just an ever increasing amount of stuff being taken from the planet. And you know, the planet only has so much to give. I would always put my money in jellies. Jellyfish have made it 500 million years. I'd give them another 500. The bay has been patient. She has provided her resource and refuge. Meanwhile, for over 50 years, we have engineered, erected, extracted. There is a balance. We are teetering. Nature will have her reckoning.